Namaste, Bengaluru. Namaste. I just came from Hyderabad. Uh, we have a uh, overseas development center there. And if I look slimmer here, it's because of, uh, you know what I blame? Hyderabad's famous biryani. <laughs> I have biryani every day. So, yeah. Um, guess where I come from? Which country? Singapore. Sorry, what do you say? Hong Kong, Hong Kong no. I'm from Singapore. Uh, who is from Singapore? Yay! <laughs> nice to always meet somebody. Who's from India? Okay, don't answer. Who's not from India? And where are you from? United States? South Africa, okay. United States is just hello, right? South Africa is, what, how do you say hello in African? Hello. <laughs> See, I just learned a new language today. <laughs> I can add African into my repertoire. Okay, I, uh, my name is Lim Chun Hyong. Lim is the family name. Uh, my name, Chun Hyong, could be quite difficult for some of you all to manage, so my friends call me Chun. And I can tell you this is a typical setting, even in my uh, ODC, 20% ladies max. In fact, this gathering, I got less than 20% ladies. We, we need to do something about it, right? Okay. So I come from DBS. Uh, who doesn't know DBS? Really? I ask who doesn't know DBS? and nobody put up their hand. It means everybody knows DBS. Wow, in India, even Americans know it. You should put up your hand. <laughs> okay, just one person. The rest who are shy can come out and tell me that you don't know DBS, and I'll, I'll give you the history lesson on DBS. Um, oh, okay. Then don't come and talk to me later. No, you, of course you can. <laughs> okay, so DBS is, uh, I'm from the land of the crazy rich Asian. You watch the movie, uh, but we're not like that. It's just a show. Uh, but I work for DBS. I've been with DBS since 2009. Uh, DBS is one of the three uh, major local banks in Singapore. Uh, of course, Ten Chat is one of the banks in Singapore as well and JP Morgan and Citibank, but a local born and bred uh, bank in, DBA, uh, in Singapore, DBS, UOB, and OCBC. Okay, I head up uh, the agile practice in DBS. Uh, so we are, we are, I have agile coaches, and we are also the center of excellence, so we actually drive and unify agile practice within DBS. Unify is just a indicative word, because we know that agile has uh, diverse practices and things like that. It's like herding cats. You try to do something and then something new uh, happens, right? Okay, but I'm here to share with you DBS transformation journey. Uh, if, you, if you know DBS, you know that DBS in the last five, ten years, we had experienced uh, phenomenal growth. Uh, last ten years, so that's, that's, does that ring a bell? I was with the bank for about ten years. I would like to claim credit for myself, that I, I was the catalyst of all these changes, but I need to be honest. Okay, enough about me. I need to turn this on. DBS was named the best bank for digital bank, uh, best digital bank in the world in 2016 and 2018. Uh, and then in 2018, last year, we won the best bank in the world. We were named the Global Bank of the World. And actually, we've got another 16 additional reward, uh, awards. Um, how did it all start? Like I say, I like to attribute it to me, but actually the truth is it started when Piyush joined the bank in 2019. I joined the bank in October 2019, and Piyush just had to follow me. He joined in November 2019. Um, when he joined the bank in the following year, he set a very ambitious goal. He says that by 2015, we want to be the Asian bank of choice. 2019. Oh, so he joined on 2009. Oh, yeah, right. 
You're right, sorry. 2009. He, he joined on 2009. I joined 2009, 10 years ago. Gosh, I get my numbers mixed up. Anyway, when he joined in 2009, 2010, when he organized the management offsite, he set a very ambitious goal to the management, the group management. He wants to be the Asian bank of choice by 2015. He is circumspect. We are an Asian bank. We're not going, gunning to be the global bank. So, in a sense, it, there's some realism in his ambition. But it will be not laughable had we not been that bad. This is DBS logo, if you have not noticed. We got um, HSBC, UOB, for those who know Singapore, this is one of our Singapore local bank, uh, City, uh, OCBC, another local bank. We were, the, we were the lowest of the pile. So for him to tell us in 2010 that we want to be the Asian bank of choice, beat all these folks uh, in five years' time, I think it was, to some of us, a very ambitious target. So how do we go about doing it? We looked inward. We look at our own processes. We know we are not the best. When you talk to people in, in Singapore 10 years back, and you tell people that I, I work for DBS, they'll say, oh, you work for that bank that is damn bloody slow. DBS. Damn bloody slow. The not so kind one will say, damn bloody stupid. Okay, because we make our customer do things because we know best. Our internal processes are the best. You have to fill in three sets of forms in triplicate. Do it if you want your loan. Four times if you want your card. You just have to do it. Otherwise, don't get anything. That's the pride of, of the bank. I mean, sometimes, right? Because we, give you, we lend you money, we provide these services, you jolly well follow what we ask you to do. But we realized that because we're at the bottom of the pile, we got all the feedback coming to us that we are not we are DBS. We need to do, do something about it. So we look inwards. We look at our internal processes. And we started this um, process improvement event where we bring um, people from the entire value stream together and solve real problems that we are facing ourselves. Notice it's still very inward looking. We are solving our internal bank process. Uh, one major uh, problem that we solved was a credit card uh, issuance uh, journey, uh, pro, uh, PIE. We used to take 60 days to issue a card. 60 days. Now you know why DBS. Huh? Okay. So, so after we went through the PIE, uh, spent five days together, do the GEMBA, do the handoff diagrams. Those who know PIE will know the typical steps. We did that and we actually reduced the number of days from 60 to 5. 60 to 5 is incredible for a bank, for our bank at a point in time. Of course, now if you go to DBS, if you are already our customer, you can have an instantaneous approval. Instantaneous approval. You don't get a physical card yet because physical card needs time to travel. But the approval is, is instantaneous. This is how far we have come. And this is a, a testimony of us as a digital bank. So that's where we are. We, we don't generate this. In fact, uh, DBS have a sustain sustainability um, uh, initiative. But you know that when we do things, especially if you ask people to fill form in triplicate, we actually generate a lot of paper waste. A lot of paper waste. We do a lot of process waste. This was uh, Hong Kong. The team came together and you notice they have a green dot on their faces because of the PIE uh, methodology of the red dot and the green dot, red dot for waste, green dot for value. So they, they say they are all value. They are all value employees, so they have green dots on their face. So um, just to shortcut the, the trip, uh, the journey for PIE, we actually in the last, in the two years that we started the program, we actually saved 250 million hours of our customers, of our, our own uh, employees as well. And because of that, in one year, we were able to turn the table around. DBS was, you remember where we were? We were here. Now we are on top of the pile. So that was when I think um, the 
media took note of the, the sudden improvement. So now that we're successful in our operational processes, the next area to look into is actually uh, IT. We know that IT, there's a lot of ways. Yes. Yes. This one? Oh, you will get the slides, you know. No me? <laughs> okay, now let me go back. So this is a very dated chaos report, but I don't think it's any, anything far off if you're still using uh, if we are still using the old way, the traditional way of managing our projects. At that point in time, 2012, DBS is definitely having a lot of problems. Um, it took more than a year to deliver an application. I'm a bit embarrassed to tell you how long it takes, but it's more than a year. Uh, uh, a lot of our projects do not meet the original business case in terms of the uh, benefits uh, analysis. Uh, after we go live, we do have to do a lot of firefighting. Uh, in 2012, and the impetus was given to us to make sure that we correct the problem. Being so successful, uh, changing our operations, making our operations a lot more effective, the logic means that you can do the same in IT, right? So we actually brought the whole uh, lean IT thinking into, lean thinking into IT, and we call it a lean IT program. Um, oops. I have a slide to show. Uh, so in Lean IT, we talk about the concept about time to market. We share with the IT folks that it's not, it's not, just, um, it's not just delivering the application on time, on target. It's also making sure that there is fit for purpose. There's a tendency for technology to de de deliver systems this way when actually people want to use it this way. So that idea of um, making sure that we are building things that the business want, and more important, that our customer want, is actually infused into our uh, tech folks as well. We also talk about quality. Building quality in is very important because if I develop and someone else is going to uh, maintain, it doesn't matter how sucky my codes are, right? Someone else is going to carry the can. But if I'm going to be the one that's carried the can, I'll make sure that I make a very good job out of it. And we're trying to infuse that, that shift left thinking that is in lean. Sorry. And this was uh, one year of effort. There. I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to share with you the absolute numbers. I'm just sharing with you the improvements that we make because it's meaningful. Our time to market was improved. We more than halved. Our quality improved and our fit for purpose measured in, uh, from the perspective of uh, the delivery of the outcome, the intended outcome has improved. So from process improvement in the op space to technology space, we have got very strong outcomes. Then come uh, 2013 when the board met, Piyush himself says that that was actually the onslaught of uh, fintech. And I think Games of Thrones started around there and we keep saying winter is coming, winter is coming. So the, uh, Piyush told the bank, we have to innovate or we die. If we want to stay as a brick and mortar bank when everybody has, has gone digital, in 50 years time, we probably will disappear. Because nowadays, who wants to step into the bank? When was the last time you stepped into a bank, physical bank, one month ago? Six months ago, one year ago, but you don't. And but when you do your banking transaction, it's almost daily, right? You don't need a physical bank. This is when we started our digitalization program in DBS, and uh, two years later, uh, the idea of having a a digital bank in India was born. So talk digital, digital, sorry, digitalization aside. So we talk about uh, inside out, right? In 2014, 2013, 2014 begins our journey of outside in. It kind of like we have kind of kept our house clean, tidied up a little bit. Now we are ready to look out. And we realized that um, a lot of times in the past, the way we do things, we are not uh, cognizant of what our customer really want. We think we know better. We've been in banking for so many years, 50 years. 
I know better than my customer. But that's not true. Because a lot of times, the, especially in this world of the VUCA world, right, customers change, things change, and we really need to have the outside in view. And this is where we started this human-centered design, human-centered design and journey thinking. We tell each other that we need to understand what's the customer job to be done. J, hashtag JTBD is created by this guy called Clayton Christensen. I think he's from Harvard, if I'm not wrong. Harvard or MIT, one of the Ivy League. Um, the idea is to distinguish the job that each one wants to do versus from the service that you are providing. And if the service that you're providing doesn't meet the job, you are missing the mark. So, for example, Bill Gates says, we don't need banks. We need banking transactions, which is why I can do all my banking transactions without walking into a physical bank. And therefore, move away from the physical bank to the digital bank is a very important um, strategy of DBS. Okay. JTBD makes us look at our customer with fresh eyes. We don't buy a drill, a power drill, because we want to drill holes. We buy power drills because we want to hang up pictures, we want to fix some um, furnitures. So if I'm 3M and I'm looking at power drills, or if I'm Bosch, I'm just looking at power drills, uh, I may miss the opportunity of having um, removable uh, stickies to, to hang up pictures, which 3M is so good at because I will, I will be looking at uh, building power drills. So this mindset change about understanding what the customer wants is a very important pillar in DBS transformation journey. We started this in our, in our company. We recognize this as an iconic journey. We call it the lost wallet journey. When you lose your wallet, what's your job to be done when you call the call center? You just want to make sure that nobody used your wallet, your credit cards, and then start charging big amounts of money. And because you know that credit card companies and banks tell you that you are liable all the way until you make the call, right? And we stop the, we stop the card. So the, your emotional journey is, please help me stop. Cancel my card, stop charging so that nobody uses my card. And how do you feel? You're feeling anxious. And for, if you are a typical customer in today's world, you probably have four or five cards in your wallet. It's not just DBS card that you're losing, right? So what we did was that when we did this customer journey, we, instead of doing it from the DBS angle, we did it from the customer's angle. The customer is anxious. The customer needs assurance. The customer has, this is the first bank they're calling. The customer has four or five, okay, that's Pride speaking, right? That's the first bank they're calling. The customer has three, four cards in the wallet. He's anxious to make sure that all the other cuts are also cancelled. We, when we did this journey, we came out with the solution that when the, any customer who lost the wallet call us, we will start off with assuring them. Number one, no charge. For, if there's no charge that has been done yet, nothing has been charged yet, we will cancel your card. By the way, do you have any other cards that you need to cancel? Do you need a phone number of UOB, Standard Chartered, JP Morgan? We've got all the numbers here. Which bank will do that? Name the competitor's numbers to another, to our own customer. But we were doing it from the customer's anger. The customer was anxious. The customer has a lot more things to do other, after this call. To make it easier for this customer, we gave him or her all the information that he needs. It's a mindset change. We developed then, um, or we we took the best of the breeds and we came up with our own 4D uh, methodology to help us do our uh, design thinking and help us solve problem. The 4D is actually, if you are familiar with the two diamonds, the double diamond, it's actually the same thing. You want to be convergent when you do discovery, divergent when you define, and then you uh, converge when you define and diverge when you do um, development and converge when you deliver. So we have four steps. Discover, define, develop, and deliver. We use this to, to do all our problem solving. 
you start with trying to understand what the real problem is before you fix yourself with a solution. Technology folks have a tendency to, I have a solution for you. We want to reverse that. I want to know what's the problem to solve before we talk about what's the solution. We start off with customer immersion. That's the, one of the first steps in discovery. We realize that people don't tell the truth, not because we are natural liars, but because we thought that's the truth, right? You know, um, uh, if you stand by and you do an interview and you, and you ask them questions, they will answer the question that they think that you want to hear. But you ask them to do something, it might be totally different. So we decided that the best way to know our customer is to be where they are. This is one of our school programs. We actually go down to the school. This is a canteen within the school to, to see how is the best way you can introduce cashless system inside a school. How do you teach a child, seven-year-old, to use cashless? I mean, nowadays they are digital native. Uh. It's very easy to just tap. But it's more than that, right? It's how do you make sure that the ecosystem is also in place? And this customer immersion is not just touching, talking about the child. It's also talking about the canteen, the bookshop, the teachers. Can the teachers also use the same cashless system to collect uh, fees and ancillary expenses? We were on the ground. My CIO came to visit the team and went to the project room. And they pasted this sign on the door. And he was so happy that the team is not in the room working. The team is out on, in the field working. Such a mindset change. People expect to see people in the office working. Now, my bosses are expecting to see the people out in the field talking to the customers. Transformation, right? Don't you think so? Yeah. I always tell people, if you are in a transformation uh, business, buy shares in 3M because we use so many post-it notes. And I've used so many other brands. They are the stickiest. Okay, so we do qualitative and quantitative data gathering, and we do um, affinitization, because you know that a lot of things are related. And from there, we can get in insights. So this is part of the discovery journey. Sorry. Oops, I think I, I went a little bit wrong. I forgot to tell you. That, yeah. So in doing all this journey and everything we do, um, in 2015, remember I told you that when Pius joined the bank, he set the ambition of being the Asian bank of choice. Did we meet the, his ambition? The answer is yes. yes. In fact, too many to list. The swans are so small. We were limited to Asia, limited to Asia, but we were the best bond house, best uh, SME bank, best whatever. 16, more than 16 awards, so many. So remember, we talk about the inside out, outside in view. We achieve the target. Then what does Piyush do? Done. I have done my job. I can go home. No, he set the next five-year target. And what's the next five-year target? If you are familiar with DBS, yeah. You know, some of us were like, really? Best bank in the world? We're from Asia, we're such a small little bank, and Singapore is just a small little dot. You expect us to be the best bank in the world, but Piyush make it very clear, he's not looking for best bank in the world in terms of size. We will never win in that space. Okay? He's looking for something else. And it took us a few years to realize what the something else is. But he set the ambition high, uh, and as usual, we get about uh, working on it. So what do we do? We talk about the next wave of the transformation journey is agility. Agility that is business-led in DBS. We also talk about data. And between 2018 and 2019, we have, another, we have embarked on another tra transformation, which I am not at liberty to share, uh, but it's quite exciting. Maybe two years later, I can come back here and share what we did. But I will share with you what we did until 2018 because uh, 2018, we won the best bank in the world. Giving, letting the cat out of the bag, but you already know. Let me talk about how uh, agility is embraced in DBS. And then I talk a little bit about uh, data-driven. And that's the journey of DBS until uh, last year. We think that it's easy to 
do agile, but the being of agile is difficult. And and if if you talk about um, the literature out there about agile, they like to use the iceberg, right, to show that what is visible and what's invisible in the agile world. The invisible is your mindset, your your values, and then the visible is your practice. We chose the rocket because unlike iceberg, rocket you can direct to go where you want to go. Okay. We want to make a di distinction between the being and the doing. What we do was that we talk about business agility, not just in the IT world, but we want to bring that mindset and that, that uh, behavior and the thinking into the business world. Remember I talked about journey thinking, the 4Ds mechanism going down into the field. We actually introduce Agile into the way we do our journeys. So this is one of our journeys where we have dedicated cross-functional teams coming together with clear roles. They do huddles, they have a cadence. We do journeys the Agile way. We're introducing how to solve business problems using an Agile way. We have co-location space for the team. We do stand-ups to make sure that, of course, it's not just about the doing, but the doing helps to build certain behaviors and uh, reinforce certain mindset. And in the stand-up, we talk about what we did yesterday, what we're doing today, and any blockers, uh, like a good scrum practice, ritual. We bring our businesses in into our uh, showcase and our reviews. Rather than putting up PowerPoints and do updates, we invite them to see the work that we do. To see the work we do, you notice that all the, power, all the post its are on the wall. We are not showcasing any PowerPoints. We are showcasing, this is actually a demo of what we are trying to create for the, the cashless school uh, canteen project. That's why it's a cute bear down there. We do sprint planning and we do backlog grooming and we do retrospective. Introducing this to the business team so that they can bring it back to their respective businesses. And the other thing I'm very proud of is this is a case I am uh, personally involved in. I coach the group audit to do agile auditing. I think Nobody can understand what Agile auditing is when we were talking about this in DBS. Because traditional way of doing audit is, I come and I tell you I'm going to audit you. And then you quake in your pants because audit is coming. And then you get all your staff ready, take care of the auditors, and then wish that they will finish, quick, hurry up, finish their job and go back. That's how traditional auditors are. But the, what happens in traditional auditing is that they will come and then they will surface things and then they'll ask for more information and the scope will creep. A three-month audit becomes a six-month audit. A one-month audit becomes a three-month audit. Is it familiar to you? Yes? No. Only you. <laughs> it's how, and people don't like audit because, not just because of the outcome, but because it, it's a, it's a never-ending thing. It's an audit with a long tail. So what we did was, we want to change. You notice that even the, the audit, um, the way we, we uh, uh, transforming audit, we also have a journey statement. This is a journey thinking. We do the 4D approach. So this is me. I was coaching the teams. Uh, we want to adopt some of the best uh, values and principles from Agile into audit. Transparency, collaboration, uh, time box, so all these things we brought in into uh, audit. And it was quite strange because when we did uh, pre-audit briefing and tell them this is what's going to happen, um, they, they have a lot of strong feedback. Okay. So this is traditional, uh, traditional audit, right? You start with an annual audit plan, you do planning calls, and then you go into field work and reporting. It's very waterfall. I do this, I do that, I do that, I do that. And typically during field work, that's where the scope creep will come in because a lot of uh, uh, things, a lot of issues get surfaced and then you have to ask for extra document uh, RFIs and things like that. So 
so what we did was we changed the audit into, this is a very familiar symbol for all of us here, right? We, what we did was we start off with a sp sprint zero planning, planning sprint. Get all the things sorted, collaborate together to identify the backlog of items that you want to audit in priority. Because we know that when you do audit, not every item is of equal importance. Some are more urgent, some are more serious. You want to audit those first. And what we want to do is that we time box our audit into sprints. And at the end of every sprint, we invite the stakeholders in for a showcase where we can highlight to them some of the things that we are seeing that's being developed. And they can then look into it and come back to us quickly. In the past, you do it at the end of the audit. Now you get it sprint by sprint. The transparency and the feedback loop is a lot tighter. But to get to this is a mindset shift because when we were sharing with them, we want to change audit into this way and we want to collaborate to work out on the backlog of audit items. The auditees always tell us, why do you think I will tell you the problems I face? Then I'm creating problems for myself. What, what makes you so sure that I will share with you the difficulties I'm facing in my daily work. If I share with you, wouldn't you write it up? It becomes an audit item, right? So what we did was, um, when you do a process walkthrough as part of the Sprint Zero, you will naturally, the issues will naturally surface because as you talk through the process, you will be asking questions around control points and risk. And then all the issues will be surfaced early and then it gets discussed and remediation can take place. We put in the usual backlog, Kanban, and all those things. We still have um, learnings, but it is a very successful uh, implementation. And from a pilot of four projects, we have gone to, uh, in 2017, 2016, 2017, 2018, we did 100 audits using the agile way of uh, auditing. Next, I want to talk about, um, so this is how we do it in uh, business agility in DBS, outside of IT. Next, I want to talk about data. For digital bank, data is very important. And in DBS, uh, you have no idea how important we treat data. We have a major program that runs across the whole bank, trying to educate everybody about the need to understand and use data responsibly. But I want to share with you one um, data insight that is very uh, important and actually because of this, it opens up the eyes of a lot of people in DBS. These are a bank of six uh, ATM Plus. ATM Plus uh, is a plus because it does dispensing of uh, cash as well as accepting of deposit of cash. So it's both a uh, withdrawal and deposit machine. Six machines, all the same, but if you look at the withdrawal, you notice that the withdrawal is higher on the left machines, and then the deposits are higher on the right machines. If I take this data and I analyze this, the first thing to do is, huh, what's wrong with these two machines? They, they seem to be only doing more deposit than anything else, and is this anything wrong with this machine? Maybe their deposit function is not working, that's why they're not taking that much money. And then I will probably send the ATM folks, maintenance folks to take a look. They'll take a look and say nothing is wrong, but the data still shows this way. So what do we do? Same bank, my bank, DBS bank. Same bank, same machine, all exactly the same. So from this data, we were a bit puzzled until we went down to visit the place. If I sit in my ivory tower, I would have got all my solutions wrong. But now you know why, right? So what should I do? What should I do? Okay, people are reading this as the line here means I withdraw here, but I deposit here. Only some brilliant people know that they can do both. So what do we do? We spend a couple hundred dollars and we change the signage. Okay. Behaviorally, maybe this is nearer to the supermarket, people come and draw some money, but you can see that the deposit has even out. I think there's a supermarket here. So people need to draw money, they come here and they draw money. But 
But that tells you that data is important. And data is important not only from the, the zero and the ones, not only from the bytes, but the holistic data. Remember we talk about being customer-centric, taking information from the customers and things like that. When we take data, we need to be very judicious. What additional data do we need before we make the right decision? This was a very important lesson to all of us in DBS. I hope you also learned the lesson from here as well. We also changed the way we work. Uh, this is our, we call the joy space. This doesn't look like a bank, but this is my office. If you come to my office, I don't have a dedicated chair and table. I can sit anywhere. And I'm very proud to share with you that in our flagship, uh, uh, in our DBS office in MBFC in Singapore, the MDs, the managing directors, generally do not have window offices. People aspire to have window offices. DBS MDs don't have window offices. Their, their MDs offices are built to the core because we believe that the best views should be open to all. If you come to DBS, if you come to Singapore, look me up, I will show you what I mean by the best views are given to everybody, the MDs sit at the core. Okay, so this is where we are. I'm going to wrap. The key takeaway is you mindset change is the most important thing and it's the hardest. And the best way to change mindset is to show. Show with real examples like the data. When you show people this is how things are, they won't be less likely to just depend on the one and the zeros to make decisions. Stakeholder engagement is key. Sponsorship from the senior management is very important. And you cannot over-communicate. Of course, at the end of the day, Agile is about teams, and therefore, we, we really need to build very strong teams. I'm trying to hurry up because i got no more time. Uh, this is my team of Agile coaches. That's my cat, if you're interested. His name is Magu. Uh, and that's all I have. But I have got five minutes to take questions, or no more time? Oh, I've got... What do you want? This one? You have a question? Yeah, she first, lady <laughs> first. <laughs> um, just to give me my, uh, give you my background. So I also work for a bank uh, mm -hmm. in Jakarta, Indonesia. It's one of the leading bank in Indonesia. So the journey was pretty quite similar, and it's good. The the one real-time um, challenge which we are facing as coaches or who are part of digital transformation is when an organization wants to implement or adopt a digital transformation, they wanted to have that, you know, the rapid uh, time for marketing and all that stuff. So what we did is we, uh, we were doing agile and all the technical process were on in place, but then what happened is too many frequent life to the market, right? So since it's a bank application, so since it's a bank company, but then we do have some products like pension, mm. the loans, credits, and all that stuff. So too many frequent changes or deploying to market, go live to market, is actually affecting the customers. Mm. Because so did you face these challenges in your company? Because when you try to enhance your am applications to from uh, legacy systems or something to a new digital way of like from uh, web application to a mobile application and then you try to have that uh, too many changes and then it goes live to market and then customers was like, they also wanted to respond quickly to the change. And when we did a mm. survey with the customers that that's the feedback that we got that it's good to have the changes and updating and all that stuff but not too frequently. Okay. So <coughs> So I, I ask, ask a question back to you guys. When your phone shows that your app library has got 20 apps to be updated, how do you all feel? It's like, yippee, now I can update my apps. No, right? It's like, oh, I got to go, I must go Wi-Fi because it's 20, I must, I must get it. I mean, if you are like me, I can't stand to have a number on any of my icons. And then I want to make sure that I update all my stuff. And you're right, sometimes consumers do face a bit of a fatigue. I think what we need to do is to make sure that every release that we go into the market has got value to the customer. 
if you are doing a, if for example, um, DBS has this PayLa uh, app that does peer-to-peer -peer fund transfer. This year, they have a update because they do a ang pao, uh, which is a which is a gift of gifting of money during the festive occasion. It is a value add to me. I would want to download that thing. So to me, it's from the consumer angle. I will always uh, update my app when there is value or there's a bug fix that is bothering me. But as a consumer, I don't like to have to update my app all the time. And therefore, I feel, I feel that sometimes we mistake frequency of update uh, as value to the customer. If there's a value and the, this is the frequency that the customer needs, then yes. But if the bank thinks this is what the customer needs and the customer don't think so, then I don't think we're doing right by the customer. We need to, you, the bank, if you ask me, needs to don't do survey. Go and see how your customer behave when they, when they receive all these updates. Did they perceive it as a value? For me, I will always press the button, but I'm not happy. You know? You mentioned about the business agility, how you started by reviewing your process and other things. So it's very easy uh, when you're doing all of that in a, lo in a centralized location. Let's say you're doing that in Singapore, you have the front office, you can ask them to come and see what you're doing from an IT perspective. Your customers are right there, all of that. But how is your Hyderabad Development Center integrated in this mm. whole process? Very good question. I just, I, I told you I just came back from Hyderabad, right? Um, we, we are trying to make distributed team work. Distributed teams are one team still. You're talking from, so from customer angle, uh, are, you to, are you talking from the development team angle or are you from the customer what angle? What other operations you have in Hyderabad? Okay. I'm, I'm assuming most of it is predominantly like, like it's Ah, it's a development it's center. Okay. So, um, Hyderabad is our major uh, ODC. Uh, what we do is that we try to make uh, the persistency at the location level. So if you're a team, you're a team in wholly formed in Hyderabad and the Singapore team is wholly formed in Singapore. But we can't, can't help to have some teams where they have some from Hyderabad and some from Singapore. And what we want to do is then we make sure that our VC uh, video conferencing tools are in place so that the, the conversation happens. In fact, we have this always on video uh, wall where you can just knock on them and you'll see, oh, somebody's looking to talk to me. It becomes a virtual team, one team. Um, the, the central team in DBS is not necessarily the central team. So some of our product owners are located in India, not necessarily all in, Sing in, in Singapore. In fact, we are beginning to see that it makes a lot of sense to push some of the business folks into Hyderabad so that the, the closeness to the development team is stronger. Uh, but to, to do personnel change will take some time. But we are, we are harvesting benefits of those who are located in India. And we are seeing that probably that's going to be one of the major initiatives that we are looking at as well. Yeah. I'm not sure whether I answer your question. I think you first. Um, you said you have a team of coaches, right? And then obviously they, are, they must be coming from... Not all, of the, not all of the coaches would have the uh, banking background, right? They must be having varied background. I'm, I'm just assuming. I'm trying to calibrate. Uh, yeah, not all the coaches come from banking background. Correct. I've got people who have coached uh, tech firms, and then I've got people who have coached banking firms. Uh, but Agile loves diversity. I'm sure I'm, that is the case. But I'm, my question is, how do you make sure, because your uh, entire journey seems to be more of business agility, how, how did you make sure that your coaches in their goals are aligned with your business agility goals? Okay, so I, while I emphasize the business agility part, my coaches are technically uh, grounded. They are very, they, they, a lot of them come from developer background and we are coaching dev teams. 
Okay. I'm just emphasizing the biz agility part of my journey because this is the biz agility track. My coaches coach. My coaches are able to do DevOps orchestration, CI, CD, everything. So in case I give you the wrong idea, but because this is biz agility track, I focus on the biz agility. Okay. Part. So I have a subsequent question. Then, do you have specialized coaches for executives? Some different coaches for dev teams. How are you managing that? Okay. So, so we also recognize that um, bosses think and behave and engage in a different way. Uh, what we do is that um, we do it on different levels. Uh, we bring in uh, world-class leaders into DBS and get them to mingle with them. So, for example, last week, uh, Ajay, I can't remember what's his last name, the MasterCard CEO yeah. was in Banga. DBS. Uh, yes, was in DBS to do a sharing session with the stakeholder. I mean, with uh, the leadership, and then we'll bring in um, uh, the the AWS uh, CTO into the space, and they share. So we talk about cross uh, cross industry sharing. We also bring in uh, executive agile coaches to host roundtables conversation. We also encourage our leaders to go into. Uh, to do site visits and things like that. And recently, we are, next week, we are running, we are getting our senior leadership to attend Singularity University in Singapore for two days to open their mind to technologies, not just agile, but actually extend our thinking beyond what's happening in the AI world, what's happening in all the different space, so that it's not just agile in the narrow sense, but agile in the, the really broader sense of the word. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll, I'll be here. You can uh, talk to me. <laughs>